there, very good evening and a warm welcome to the news live on Rupaini Channel I. I'm Sharon Maskrinis. And I'm Dishan Virakun and here are your headlines for tonight. Postal Services recommends the eight COVID-19 related death reported today. The number of fully recovered patients stands at 194. The Prime Minister says Sri Lanka has not received any foreign financial aid pertaining to the COVID-19 epidemic. 24 billion rupees allocated for the payment of pensions and allowance for the elderly, differently able persons and kidney patients. The Attorney General has notified the Elections Commission to take the necessary actions to hold the general election in compliance with the law. The Wesak Week begins. U.S. President Donald Trump yet again says that COVID-19 related deaths in the U.S. could exceed 100,000. Day-to-day public life in South Korea gradually returns to normal. Now moving on into those and other stories in detail. Now President Gotabe Rajapaksha says that the government is ready to share the experiences gained in combating the spread of the COVID-19 virus with the member nations of the non-allied movement. Pres the president also pointed out the necessary assistance from the international financial organizations and lending nations to help developing countries adversely affected by the COVID-19 calamity. The President made these remarks while addressing the online special summit of non-aligned movement held today. The special online summit of the heads of state and government of NAM member states was convened at the initiative of the President Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan as the current chair of the movement. The summit set to conclude with a political declaration of the movement uniting against COVID-19 as well as identified measures for enhanced co coordination among NAA member states in their common fight against COVID-19. This summit will serve as an important platform for the NAM member states to support collective global action in combating this deadly virus and sharing best practices and lessons learned. I extend my deepest condolences to all those who have lost loved ones during the pandemic and express deep appreciation to the frontline health care and essential workers, both in Sri Lanka and globally, for their dedication and selfless commitment. Sri Lanka remains deeply concerned by the unprecedented consequences arising from this pandemic to all our countries and peoples, including its catastrophic health impact, accompanying humanitarian crises, devastation of economies, and social and psychological tensions, among others. Sri Lanka, therefore, is pleased to endorse the declaration of this summit. Sri Lanka recognizes the timely initiative to establish a NAM task force to compile a database of basic humanitarian and medical needs of the member states to sensitize donors on urgent requirements. We commend the COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan and the establishment of the United Nations COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund. Sri Lanka also supports the endeavors of the WHO, which has been playing a vital role in shaping the global response to the pandemic. Sri Lanka has been successfully containing and controlling the COVID-19 threat. Out of the total PCR tests conducted so far, only 3% has been confirmed as infected. The death rate is at a very low level of 0.97%. In early February, my government established a task force comprising key health personnel, high-ranking military personnel, and administrators to monitor the spread of the pandemic and also take required measures to combat the spread of the virus. The first COVID-19 Sri Lankan patient 
was identified on March 11. Initially, patients were Sri Lankans who came from several countries. Since then, 717 infected persons have been detected, 183 persons have been cured and discharged, while 527 persons are being treated as active cases. Most of these persons were asymptomatic. We adopted a few special and unique measures, establishment of quarantine centers managed by the armed forces, and the deployment of the state intelligence services, the police, and the public health inspectors to do contact tracing. Both these measures have helped Sri Lanka cope with this pandemic quite successfully, enabling the health authorities to function at the optimum level. Whenever a person afflicted with the virus was detected, the contact tracing method was used to find out details of persons with whom the afflicted person had come into contact. Once identified, all such persons were taken to a specially designated quarantine centers or arrangements were put in place to self-quarantine such persons. If an entire area was found to have been contaminated, such areas were isolated and quarantined. Of the 31 clusters identified so far, 27 have been completely neutralized, while the other four are being kept under strict control, eliminating any spillover to the general population. There have also been extensive PCR testing, and health authorities are continuing to conduct more PCR tests. Given an excellent free healthcare system, which includes a well-established preventive mechanism placed throughout the country, Sri Lanka has been able to contain the spread of this deadly virus utilizing the public health processes. In order to assist the health authorities and other services deployed to combat the spread of the COVID-19 virus, my government declared a curfew from 18 March 18 throughout the island and restricted movement of people. With work coming to a standstill, Sri Lanka has taken a series of measures In the meantime, Postmaster General Ranjit Ariratna says upon the instructions of the government, all post offices in the island recommenced postal services today. These include the disbursement of pension payments and all other services. The government has taken this step with the intention of continuously providing essential services such as the home delivery of pharmaceuticals dispensed from clinics and the payment of pensions. Thereby, all post offices were seen open today in areas where curfew was lifted. The post offices are kept open for the provision of limited services. Prime Minister Mind the Rajapaksa says no financial aid pertaining to the COVID-19 situation has been received by the country from foreign donors. The Premier disclosed these details at the discussion of the former parliamentarians that was convened at Temple Trees today. This meeting was convened to educate the former parliamentarians on the situation in Sri Lanka with regard to the COVID-19 spread and the future steps that need to be taken. Former parliamentarians of the Sri Lanka Putrajana Peramuna, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the Tamil National Alliance, the Ilangai Tamil Arasukachi, the Mahajana Eksat Peramuna, the National Freedom Front, the Pevituru Hello Rumia, the Ceylon Workers Congress, the Elam People's Democratic Party, the Democratic Leftist Front, the All Ceylon Muslim Congress and the Deshavi Mukti Janata Party, the Sri Lanka Communist Party, the Lanka Samasamaja Samasamaja Party and the Sri Lanka Marjana Paksha and the Democratic People's Front participated at the meeting.
Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa pointed out that all parliamentarians were summoned to educate them on the steps taken and to obtain new ideas in order to strengthen the measures and also to discuss aspects on economic development. Leader of the Tamil National Alliance, R. Samman then presented a set of proposals to the Prime Minister. Several bills and proposals have been voiced by the former former parliamentarians with regard to controlling the COVID-19 virus and restoring normalcy to the public life. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa says these views will be discussed and the suitable proposals will be implemented in the coming days. Secretary said the World Bank has agreed to provide the country with 127 million US dollars. However, the sum has still not been received on the agreement has been signed. He further stated $127 million is to be provided for the Ministry of Health to meet the expenses pertaining to the COVID-19 epidemic. In addition, the Ministry Secretary said material aid has been received. In the meantime, except in the high-risk areas, curfew in 21 districts was relaxed for 15 hours today. Curfew that was lifted in these districts at 5 a.m. was reimposed at 8 p.m. today. Curfew in high-risk areas is in place until further notice. Curfew in 21 districts was lifted for 15 hours after three days. In these districts, curfew will be enforced from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. the following day until Wednesday. However, in the high-risk areas, which are the districts of Colombo, Gampaha, Kalutara and Puttalam, the imposed curfew will continue until further notice. In addition, curfew will be enforced island-wide from 8 p.m. on the 6th of May to 5 a.m. on the 11th of May. The government states restoring organizational activities and day-to-day -day public life whilst curfew is in force in high-risk areas will begin on the 11th of this month. Thereby, public and private sector organizations in the Colombo, Gampaha, Kalutara and Puttalam districts should be kept open from the 11th. The heads of the organizations have been instructed to draw plans for this purpose in advance. When organizations are kept open, health guidelines need to be followed completely. Private sector organizations should open at 10 a.m. The number of employees to be summoned for work in both sectors needs to be decided by the heads of the respective organizations. Passenger transportation in trains and CTB buses have been restricted only for those heading for work. Except those who necessarily need to report to work, others are advised to remain at home and support the efforts to control the COVID-19 spread. Individuals should exit their homes only for the purpose of purchasing essential commodities such as food items or pharmaceuticals. The permission granted to exit one's home according to the last digit of the National Identity Card is relevant to areas in which curfew is in force and will come into effect from the 11th of this month. It will not be relevant for the public in areas in which curfew has been lifted. Even though curfew is relaxed, the public needs to adhere to the guidelines mandated by the government and refrain from gathering in crowds. DIG Ajit Rohan says when considering international data with regard to the corona situation amongst the countries in which the COVID-19 virus has spread to a vast extent, America is at the top whilst a number of European countries are amongst the hardest hit. However, the DIG points out that Sri Lanka is at the 160th place and this clearly shows what a satisfactory position the country holds in controlling the COVID-19 virus under the guidance of the state and with the support of the public and the private sector. The DIG points out in order to consistently maintain this country situation, public support is needed. मेरठे जनताव विशेष रूप में अपील आबाद इन लादो उपदेश सानुव अनुगत विमे प्रतिपालिया खटी टे आपी दाखिने नव ऑपरेशंस टू अरेस्ट कर्फ्यू वायलेटर्स आर अंडरवे थ्रू आउट द आइलैंड 
The police stayed thereby within the 24-hour period from 6 a.m. yesterday to 6 a.m. today. 1,169 curfew violators have been arrested, whilst 314 vehicles have been seized. Since the imposition of curfew, 46,397 curfew violators have been arrested, whilst the number of vehicles seized by the police has been 12,049. And here's a look at the COVID-19 situation overseas. And we start with Italy, where they commenced on Monday to unwind Europe's longest coronavirus lockdown, letting some 4.5 million people return to work after nearly two months at home and finally allowing families to reunite. After seven weeks of strict lockdown measures, Italy took the first step towards returning to normal on Monday. 4.5 million people were given the green light to return to work and families were finally allowed to reunite. Parks will also reopen on Monday so Italians can run and do other outdoor activities so long as they stay two metres apart. But groups of friends must refrain from meeting up. Schools, cinemas and theatres remain shuttered up and most shops won't be able to open their doors until May 18th. With almost 29,000 deaths since the outbreak emerged, Italy has the world's second highest toll after the United States. And while the lifting of restrictions is welcomed by most, there's fear of a second wave. In an interview with La Stampa newspaper on Sunday, Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte stressed that the so-called phase two of the lockdown must not be seen as a signal that we're all free, adding that Italy is still in the full throes of the pandemic. Conte said that phase two would include more testing to see who has the virus, with five million kits sent to the regions in the next two months. From this week, some 150,000 blood tests will be carried out to get an idea of how many Italians have already developed antibodies. Spain, Nigeria, Malaysia and Lebanon are among the other countries also easing some restrictions on Monday. Now in Japan, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has extended the country's state of emergency until the end of May. Japan has extended its national state of emergency until May the 31st. It's been in place since April the 7th. On Monday, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said Japan hasn't seen the explosive surge in infections seen in other countries, but he said the emergency measures were still needed. At the moment, we are still seeing a considerable number of cases of new infections and the number of infected people hasn't decreased enough. There are areas where medical facilities are still under pressure. The experts say we need to continue the measures we are taking now for the time being. Abe said he'll consider lifting the state of emergency before the end of May, if his expert advisers recommend it. But for the moment, in the 13 prefectures that have been hardest hit, including Tokyo and Osaka, the target of reducing person-to-person -person contacts by 80% will remain in place. Japan is planning to transition to a set of arrangements that aim to stop the spread of infections while maintaining social and economic activities. Well over 15,000 people have been infected in Japan and more than 500 have died. Meanwhile, New Zealand and Australia could soon open their borders to each other, creating what they call a trans tasman bubble as they look to restart the economies after getting their coronavirus outbreaks under control. New Zealand and Australia could soon open their borders to each other as they begin to restart their economies after getting a hold on their respective coronavirus outbreaks. The neighbours, who are separated by the Tasman Sea, have substantially lowered their virus spreads to a level well below those in the United States and many countries in Europe. Here's New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. One key aspect of our plan to get New Zealand moving is the work on the trans-Tasman bubble. Today I can confirm that I've accepted uh, Prime Minister Morrison's invitation to participate via video link in the Australian National Cabinet meeting scheduled for tomorrow. The meeting will discuss a range of matters in relation to the COVID response on both sides of the Tasman, including the creation of a trans-Tasman travel bubble. Neither Scott Morrison nor Ardern has outlined what a bubble would look like and there's no time frame, but it would likely allow free movement between Australia and New Zealand while both keeping their borders closed with other countries. Australia and New Zealand have very close economic ties, with Australia the most important source of international tourists into New Zealand, according to Deutsche Bank economist Philip O'Donoghue. 
With airlines resuming services, he says a trans-Tasman bubble would likely go a long way to alleviate the negative virus impact on New Zealand's tourism trade. Now shifting focus to South Korea, now South Koreans across the country went on shopping sprees over the weekend after weeks of being cooped up as ho at home as the government relaxes its social distancing measures and as customers return to department stores, movie theatres and amusement parks. South Koreans across the country went on shopping sprees over the weekend after weeks of being cooped up at home. They call it pobok sobi or revenge shopping and South Koreans had days to throng department stores. It was the first long weekend since social distancing rules began rolling back last month. 55-year-old Lee Jong-hee was one of those eager shoppers. I came here with my friend to get some fresh air. Now I can buy accessories after trying them myself. It feels so good because I can shop in person. Major retail chains like Lotte Shopping and Hyundai Department Store trumpeted bargain sales to lure customers in. The nationwide splurge gave a much-needed boost to the economy after weeks of stay-at-home measures took their toll. However, South Korea's early action meant it largely saw success in managing the global health crisis. And on Sunday, the government said it would roll back those limits further this week. They also warned people to stay vigilant even as daily life resumes. Having social distancing rules in daily life means social and business activities are allowed, but individuals and communities need to take responsibility themselves. Locals looking to kick the cabin fever also return to amusement parks, movie theaters, and even airports. There's been a surge in demand for domestic travel. Korean Air said it's nearly doubled the number of passenger flights between the capital Seoul and the popular vacation spot Jeju Island. In local news, the Ministry of Finance states that 24 billion rupees have been allocated for the payment of pensions and allowances granted for the elderly, differently able persons and kidney patients. Secretary to the Finance Ministry, Sar Article, says out of this allocation, 19 billion rupees were released by the Treasury for the payment of pensions today. A sum of 4 billion rupees has been set aside for payment of elders, differently able persons and kidney patient allowances. These monies will be released as soon as the relevant registers are received from district secretaries. And the ministry secretary also stated that funds have also been kept ready to pay allowances that are granted due to the COVID-19 epidemic. The 5,000 rupee allowance paid upon the instructions of the President Gotabe Rajapaksa for groups for adversely affected by the spread of the coronavirus will be paid in the month of May as well. The dis disbursement of the allowance for the month of May will be in the process from today and will be paid before Wesa Full Moon Poya Day. The President also decided with the effect from the month of March to pay 5,000 rupees each for elders, differently able persons and kidney patients. This allowance will be granted for the beneficiaries whose names are listed in the initial registers and for those who are on waiting lists. The government has taken steps to pay pensions for retired government servants tomorrow and the day after. The Presidential Task Force on Economic Restoration and Poverty Alleviation states facilities have been put in place to pay pensioners in the same way in which their pension for the month of April was paid. Facilities have been provided to transport pensioners to banks, pharmacies and also to the nearest Ayurvedic centres to obtain treatment. Now in more local stories, the Attorney General has notified the Elections Commission to take the necessary actions to hold the general election in compliance with the law. This notification was made in response to the Elections Commission inquiring of the Attorney General with regard to the dates pertaining to the calling of nominations. Attorney General Dapula Dulevera notified the Election Commission today in writing to take the necessary actions to hold the general election. Coordinating Secretary to the Attorney General Nishara Jarafna says today the Chairman of the Elections Commission in writing sought the advice of the Attorney General querying as to whether any legal constraint prevails with regard to accepting nominations on the 17th, 18th and 19th of March when the three days were dictated special public holidays. The Coordinating Secretary stated that in response the Attorney General has stated that since the Elections Commission has accepted nominations and the next level of procedures have been implemented, the necessary action needs to be taken to hold the 2020 parliamentary election in compliance with the law. 
The Mahasangha states all Buddhists should prepare to observe Vesak this year by giving more priority to Pratipati Puja rather than Amisa Puja. They expressed these views at a media briefing held in Colombo today, chaired by the Minister Dr. Bandulakunavardhana on the expected conduct of the media in the country with regard to observing the Vesak week. The media briefing was held at the Ministry of Mass Media. This year's Vesak celebrations are to be held on the state patronage under the theme Arogya Paramalaba Samputi Paramanandan, the highlighting that health is the greatest wealth and profit. The significance of hoisting the Buddhist flag at all Buddhist homes and every building of state institutions during the Vesak week, which is from today until the 8th of May, was emphasized. A number of measures that need to be implemented throughout the Vesak week, including having liquor shops, clubs and gambling bookies remain closed island-wide, were discussed, and the importance of the media raising awareness on these measures was emphasized. Attention was also focused on the circular released by the Ministry of Public Administration and Home Affairs on the procedure to be followed from the 6th to the 8th of this month was also given attention. Representatives of a number of electronic and print media institutions joined in the media briefing. Now, a special team of the CID arrested a suspect in connection with several charges, including organizing extremist sermons pertaining to the series of bomb attacks on Easter Sunday. The arrest was made in the Kalpitiya area in Puttalam last evening. The arrestee is a resident of 4th Cross Street, Kalpitiya. The suspect has been arrested in connection with spreading extremism by conducting sermons at an Arabic school in the Maduran Kulia area in Puttalam by inviting a group that included Saharan Hashim, who organized and unleashed the Easter Sunday attacks, and Mohammed Ibrahim, who was another bomber. After he was escorted to the Maduran Kulia Arabic school last night, the building was searched and several documents were taken into custody of the officers. Information has been received that the school received financial aid for the construction of buildings from many parties, including a politician. Outsiders are allowed entry to this premise upon only upon special permission. Details were presented before the Colombo Fort Magistrate Court pertaining to the suspect and further investigations are underway upon detention orders.